Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I just mentioned, uh, today is the first Sunday of Advent. Our word Advent comes from the Latin Adventus, which literally means coming. In the season of Advent, we mark two comings, making Advent a kind of layered time. On the one hand, we remember the first coming of Jesus, and so our standing with Israel as we await the coming of her Messiah. But on the other hand, we look forward to the second coming, when Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. That is, in Advent, we look not only to the coming of a baby in a manger, we also look to the end of all things. Advent is the first light of the judgment, the first sign of the coming of the dawn. And so Advent presses upon us a question. As this first light approaches, what should we do? How should we respond to the coming of the day? All three readings designated for the Sunday give us the same answer. Wake up. Keep awake, Matthew says, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Now is the moment for you to wake from sleep, says Romans, for the night is far gone. And the day is near. O house of Jacob, says Isaiah, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The call that goes out on this first Sunday of Advent is this. O sleepers of the earth, awake. It is a stirring challenge. It comes to us directly without mincing words. And yet the straightforward nature of this charge may also cause us to miss its deeper meaning. In order to see this, I want to talk about two things this morning. First, I want to talk about what it means that we are asleep. Secondly, I want to talk about what it might look like for us to wake up. If you're like most people, when you hear the word sleep, you immediately think of one thing. You think about how tired you are. Am I right? Anybody here this morning tired? Uh, many of you know that today is actually my wife's due date, and so um, that's actually why I have my cell phone with me here in the pulpit uh, this morning. Uh, so that, you know, if you hear hotline bling, uh, it's not because Drake is in the building, uh, it's because my son is, right? Uh, and so uh, today is my wife's due date, um, and people keep telling us that the word due date, that we should start translating the word due date. Uh, as the last day of sleep that we're ever going to get. And most of you, I imagine, are like them. Most of you are tired. Maybe you're tired from the pressures and stress of raising a family. Maybe you're tired from the relentless demand of your job. Maybe you're just tired, more generally, from the worries and cares of this life. If 
this is where your mind goes when you hear the word sleep, then the command to wake up is likely going to sound shrill, like the grating siren of the alarm clock when it forces you to rise in the morning. Doesn't God know how exhausted I already am, we might think? How can God demand any more effort than I'm already giving? If you're feeling that way right now, I have some good news. There's actually some bad news that comes with it, but first, the good news. When scripture refers to us as sleepers, it's not trying to shame us for being lazy. There may be some among us who are lazy, but that's not what scripture means when it calls us sleepers. Notice again in our gospel reading for this morning, that among those who are asleep include those who are working in the field, those who are working in the mill. Rather, a better word for what scripture means by sleep here would actually be a dream. A dream. The type of sleep we're talking about here is more like a trance. By calling us sleepers, Scripture doesn't mean that we're tired. Rather, it means to say that we are bewitched. It's saying that we have been captivated, hypnotized, and spellbound by a vision of this world that is false and illusory. Which brings us to the bad news. And though this point is bad, it's also crucial. The language of sleep in our text for this morning is not meant to shame us for being tired. It is meant to dramatize the central problem of Scripture, namely, idolatry. Idols throughout the biblical narrative offer up a kind of fantasy, a dream that mesmerizes the people of God with a chimera of a false world, like the tree in the Garden of Eden, which promised Adam and Eve the knowledge of the gods, like the golden calf at Sinai, which symbolized all the wealth and the riches of Egypt, like Baal, or Chemosh, or Moloch, who promised their followers victory in battle who promised them power over their enemies. These idols left God's people asleep, left them so enchanted by this dream world that they lost sight of who they were and what their mission was in this world. From a biblical standpoint, this is what it means to be a sleeper. But before we talk about what it means to wake up, I want to press a kind of practical point here. For many of us, I suspect, it's precisely our pursuit of these false gods that have left us so exhausted. Isn't it? False gods like money or success or power, or fame. Our idols offer us a dream, but a dream that remains perpetually beyond our reach, such that we spend all our lives anxiously grasping after what was never really there, such that the dream that these idols once offered for many of us has now become a nightmare. That is to say, the dream world offered to us by our idols is not just false. It is perverse. What they give is the opposite of what they offer. What they leave us with is the lives that we hope for turned inside out. 
So when scripture calls us to wake from these dreams, it's not trying to place yet another anxious burden on our backs. To the contrary, the call to awake is a call to cast aside these burdens and remember ourselves, to come back to God's reality and remember our again, remember again our calling in this world. The question this raises is, what might it look like to wake from this dream? What might it look like to remember ourselves again? Our reading from Isaiah for this morning gives us a stunning vision of how this might look. And truth be told, it's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. I don't know if priests are really allowed to have favorite passages of Scripture, but I do. And this one is right at the top of the list. And it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture because it envisions a traumatic reversal. A traumatic reversal of the dream world that was offered to us by our idols. In the climax of this passage, Isaiah gives us two striking images. Swords being turned into plowshares. And spears being turned into into pruning hooks. Plowshares and pruning hooks are instruments of life. A plowshare is a kind of big garden hoe. It tills, aerates, and readies the soil for planting. It prepares the land for God's holy gifts. It opens the soil and makes the soil ripe to bear fruit. Pruning hooks, on the other hand, were used to remove diseased or damaged tissue from plants. You prune because once the damaged parts of the plant are removed, all the plant's energy can go once again to producing flowers or fruit. Pruning is trimming or shaping for new growth and new life. Plowshares and pruning hooks are the symbols of true human flourishing. The problem is that in the days of Isaiah, the kings of Israel had become enchanted by a different vision of the world. They had become entranced by a very different dream. In those days, major national empires were emerging all around them. And Israel wanted a piece of the action. So in 1 Samuel 8, we read of Israel crying out for a king like the nations. A king, as they put it, who would go out before them and lead them in to battle. The prophecy of Joel gives us a vision of where that aspiration led using terms patently reminiscent of our reading from Isaiah for this morning. According to Joel, years of warfare had left Israel's heart broken, had left the earth itself ravaged. Israel's livelihood and its resources were being ripped away before their eyes, such that even the plowshares had now been turned into swords and the pruning hooks into spears. Here it's the instruments of life that are being forged into instruments of death. And through them, life itself is being turned into death. It is into this devastation that Isaiah speaks of Advent. Isaiah declares that another day is coming, a Christmas day. A day is coming, Isaiah says, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. 
And on that day, the instruments of battle and death will be reforged into instruments of life and peace. On that day, those tools which we once used to harm ourselves will again be turned into producing health and flourishing. Isaiah's vision is a vision of profound hope. It is a hope that God is making all things new. That God will come and dwell with his people. That death will be no more. That mourning and crying and pain will be no more. This is why Isaiah ends by saying, let us walk in this way. Isaiah is saying, wake up to this vision of the world. Set aside those idolatrous aspirations which have truncated your vision of God and yourself. Open your eyes. Lift up your face. Rise up and see the Savior of the world is now approaching. So with all that said, I want to close this morning by raising a question. God has filled each of our lives with proverbial plowshares and pruning hooks. Tools meant to bring forth abundance from us and the world around us. And yet, I wonder, how often do we twist and reforge these gifts into instruments of harm and destruction? How often do we beat our plowshares into swords? Think of a talent you have, or a position you hold, or a relationship that you have with another person. God has given you these things in order to breathe life into this world, in order to help the world bear fruit. But how often do we use these things purely for our own benefit? to meet our own wants and needs, to increase our own power and influence, to make ourselves great among the nations. And how often do we turn our pruning hooks into spears? It's not exactly easy to face the shears. But how do you respond when you're put in a tough situation? Do you get angry and lash out? Do you become passive aggressive or manipulative? What about when you come to see that you are in the wrong? Do you rationalize and self-justify? Do you try to shift the blame and criticize others? Are you even able to see it when you are in the wrong? How many things in our lives that were meant to be plowshares and pruning hooks are instead functioning as swords and spears? I ask because we need to see these things. But I also ask, because it's in seeing these things that the dreams behind them will also become visible. It's when we come to see our gifts turn to weapons in our hands that we might just see the spell that has bound us begin to break that we might just see the idols that we worship for the illusions that they are and might find
finally start to let them go. Oh, sleepers of the earth, now is the time to awake. For the night is far gone, and the day is near. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord.